So now Joel Curtis is coming back up, share with us a little time, and then that will lead in to our music fest. We'll have a little bit of a break while they all set up and stuff like that. So oh, you've seen his face. He's the one who's doing all the ads on Facebook and doing all these interviews and doing all this stuff. He's a go-getter and loves the Lord. And I mean, I'm so glad I've gotten... It makes me want to come back here and visit more. You know, you guys, you guys do that to me. I mean, I know I have a home here with you all. I mean, literally, you all. I mean, I stay at Sylvie's, but I'm with y'all. Okay. So, Joe. Hola. All right, everybody, stand up just for a second. We just got to get our circulation going. Um, we're just going to. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The glory of the Lord covers the face of the earth. Uh, Andrea, or Ashley, I think Ashley read this verse earlier, the Colossians verse that says, the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Jesus in bodily form. And in Christ, you've been brought to fullness. So God is in you. He's all around you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep breath. Ready? Whether you're inhaling or exhaling, it's him. You ready? Take a deep breath. You know what you're breathing in? Hopium. <laughs> Thank you, Louie, for that. Y'all can sit down. It's hopium. We're breathing, we're breathing him in. We're breathing him out. Why is this? There we go. All right. Um, I was encouraged. I heard this... Uh, Description of the word testimony in Hebrew. Uh, we, we talked about that at the beginning of the uh, session this morning that uh, Rich Strickland brought up that verse that said, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Testimony in Hebrew literally means do it again story. It's a do it again story. It's what it means in Hebrew. So the blood of the lamb represents, of course, the, uh, the gospel message. In the gospel message, when we share the story of the gospel, it is infused and charged with the power of salvation. And when it's mixed with what? Faith, belief, what happens? Bam, it's the catalyst, right? It's like the filament in the light bulb and the electricity going through it. But when you share your testimony, guess what it's charged with? It is charged with the power of a do-it-again story when it is mixed with belief. That's it. So wanted to throw that one out there because when we hear these stories that everyone's saying, like, can God do that for me? Can God do that for me? Can God do that for me? We all hear each other's stories. And, like, and the answer is a resounding yes. All his promises are yes and amen. And then we hear the word of each other's testimonies and each one becomes a tidal wave of potential energy, potential kingdom-changing, life-changing, everything. Then you hear the simplicity of this Galatians 2.20 message. You're like, oh, that's what I want. I want that. I want that freedom. So uh, before I get too deep into this, uh, Craig, thank you for sharing. If you've not spent time with Craig, you need to spend time with Craig and Winnie. That's his wife right next to him. And just get to know them. They are fantastic people. Full of life, full of joy, full of childlike faith. Just beautiful. Brett, thank you. Louie, thank you. Andrea, Ashley, Sylvia, Scott, thank you for everything you've done, how you pour out. Steve, thank you for pouring yourselves out, sharing your stories. Um, Sylvia, you began with asking this question this morning. Why do we need a Jesus revolution. And she, you know, spoke a little bit about, um, you know, do not be deceived. Jesus saying, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. There's so much deception going on. And so we have to keep our faces continually in the reality and the truth of the gospel. If we do not, like, you know, like the way they, you, everyone's heard this, but people like the FBI, when they try to bust somebody for counterfeit, the way they do that is not by studying counterfeit. They study the real thing. 
continually, continually. They're holding it. They're exchange. They're they're feeling it, touching it, smelling it, tasting it. I don't know, but the idea is that you're so familiar with what is the real thing. Immediately, the counterfeit's exposed. You can feel it immediately. You see it, you feel it. It's it's tactile. You just know it's the counterfeit. Um, and part of that is like my uh, there's a good friend of mine. His name's uh, Chris Blackaby. He's a friend of. Dan's as well. Chris is, lives in Adelaide, Australia. He taught me more about sonship than anybody else on the face of this earth. The gift on him to teach about your identity as a son of God is I've never heard anybody teach the way that he teaches. So like, if you want to hear more about who he is at some point, I'll, I'll share that with you. He has this little simple definition of religion. He says religion is doing something to get something that God has already given you as a free gift. And we don't need to do anything to get something that we've already received as a free gift. And so it's just continually putting that in front of us, saying, if I'm doing something, I'm operating in some sort of counterfeit faith. It's not real. And then my buddy Kirby, like, why do we need a revolution? He says, you know, there's all this cry out for revival, revival, revival. He said, but what we need is reformation. Because if our doctrines don't get the upgrade, our operating system will always default to the old. It just always defaults to the old. That's why when you hear Brett get up and just systematically walk you through and it just gets stacked nice and neat and ordered, you're like, well, yeah, well, yeah. And you think it's easy to explain. It's not easy to explain it the way that Brett explains it. You're like, this is absolutely brilliant. (laughs) Thank you for the gift that you bring the body of Christ, Brett. Thank you. Because we, what, revival's great, but at the end of the day, it's a flash in the pan if your doctrines don't get upgraded. You're like, well, that was awesome. Why did it happen? We don't know, but wasn't it awesome? And then you're like, you're back out crying for revival again. As opposed to, if your doctrines get upgraded, guess what happens? You live in a constant state of what that revival was. Revival's no longer a flash in the pan because your doctrines get upgraded and you just simply operate out of a constant fixed knowing, as Norman calls it, a fixed knowing. Like, this is who I am in him. Because your doctrines are right. And they need to be looked at occasionally. Like, are we getting this right? Is there something more true that I need to know, Lord? Because what I've discovered is, after attending um, Soviet study for the past year and a half, is I was realizing, even in the past five or six years, when I was learning more about my identity as a son, is what I grew up believing wasn't completely in error but there's more there's always there's this moreness to like oh the cross didn't just just do this it did this and guess what else the cross did this guess what else the cross and it just keeps expanding and becoming more beautiful there's a more that we're after so anyway i'm going to get into a little bit of my story and because m- many of you don't really know me but um or my history, but I grew up in a believing home. My parents are in the back, Tom and Judy Gertis, back there at that table, beautiful people. Um, My mom's parents were missionaries in Alaska when she was born. Uh, They were part of the Assemblies of God Church and uh, ministered to the Inuit Alaskan people and uh, lived in Sitka when she was born, Sitka, Alaska. And ministered in the interior. My dad's mom, uh, he and my uh, grandmother, he grew up going to the Congregational Church in Connecticut with his mom. So I came from I come from a home that is of faith. They taught me about Jesus early growing up, and <clears throat> one of my uh, earliest memories of just really my like being taught who God is, who I am, the relationship, the quality of the relationship that I had with the Lord was, um, I want to say it was in the mid-80s. It's whenever the movie Top Gun came out. You remember Top Gun? Everybody wanted to be Tom Cruise. And every boy my age wanted Ray-Ban, Aviator, Gold Rim, Sunglasses. And I was no different. At the time, my mom worked at an eyeglass store, literally right in the shopping center next door. 
and uh, and I asked her, I said, hey, can you get me a discount on those Ray-Bans? She goes, absolutely, I could probably get you a discount. But she goes, what I want you to do, though, is I want you to pray about it. And I'm like, pray about what? It's sunglasses, right? And <clears throat> she's like, yeah, just pray. I go, well, what am I supposed to pray? She says, pray and ask God if he wants you to have them. Oh, okay. It was strange to me, but I'm like, okay. So anyway, I'm, I'm going camping that weekend with our youth group. We get in the van. On the way there, I say a quick prayer, something along the lines of, God, I don't know if you want me to have these Ray-Bans or not, but could you let me know? It was very, you know, not a very spiritual prayer, which turns out is a pretty spiritual prayer. <laughs> you know, it's like he wants it simple like that. Anyway, we're, we're on the Blue River somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, and we're canoeing down the river and wherever we we just pick a random spot to camp out and we find a place to camp it's crazy hot so we set up our camp and our friends are we're all in the water trying to cool off and it's like waist waist deep water and it's kind of moving at us kind of quickly so we're like you know doing this trying to go upstream you know how it is and you're moving slowly so you don't step on something really sharp underneath and um something caught my eye and I just grabbed my friend Charles by the shoulder because I thought he was about to step on a broken bottle. I reached my hand down. Ray band gold rim sunglasses without a scratch on them. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, so I go home and I tell mom the story and she goes, Yep. She goes, That's how God God would just do that for us all the time when we were on the mission field. You just talk to him about something you need or something you want, or something you desire. So she, they just started teaching me about prayer and knowing him. Um, and then I'm fast-forwarding. I'm going to skip through a bunch of different stories because I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. Just trust me. Um, my sophomore year, I stopped attending the church school that we had been going to uh, most of my life. Started going to another local church here. It was a great time of just new things. And when I did that, I decided to switch to J-Town High School. And the only way that I could attend J-Town High School, since I lived outside of the district, was to choose a class that they offered that the school in my district didn't offer. And the only class that they offered that my school in my district didn't offer was Russian. So I was like, yeah, I'll take Russian. So for two years, I took uh, Russian... And I remember at my my graduation party, one of uh, my parents' friends was passing through town, and he stopped by for my graduation party. He said, hey, tell me about uh, school. What's your favorite subject? I go, Russian. He goes, what? He goes, I'm going to Russia this summer. You want to go with me? I'm like, yes, I would love to go to Russia with you. So I'm, I'm uh, 19, and my parents are all on board and uh, end up going just with this guy. It's not a big mission trip. It's just literally a friend of my parents that lives lived in Oregon at the time. He said, "Just you're going to go to Russia with me. So I go to Russia. We go to Vladivostok, which is on the eastern seaboard, so not Moscow. Think 13 time zones away. See a Japan, that area. I get there. I'm 19 years old. And this guy that I'm traveling with, his name is Mel. Mel says, hey, I'm going I'm to send you out with some high school students uh, on like a walkabout. <laughs> basically like i'm just sending you out and you're just going to follow the spirit wherever he takes you that's what i'm like what is this i've never experienced anything like this in my life so the guys i go with i'm 19 and he sends me out with two 16 year olds and a 17 year old um all russian teens dudes and they said hey just pack a light bag take a little bit of money but that's all you need just take a light bag with you uh because we're gonna be doing a lot of walking i'm like okay and uh, we take a ferry a couple hours, cross this strait, this channel of water, and we land on this little strip of land that's just north of North Korea and borders China, that little strip of land right there. And we're, like, hitchhiking everywhere or walking or whatever. We come to this very, the very first town that we're supposed to go to. No one knows we're coming. We've not told anybody anything. And there's 50 people on the edge of town waiting for us. And they were like, they're like, we've been waiting for you. Like, we've not told anybody we're coming. Why are you 
here, they're like, we all want to be baptized. And we're like, what? And they're like, Joel, you're going to baptize them. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, God, I've never baptized anybody in my life. And so we, we baptize everybody that wants to be baptized. We're in the Sea of Japan. It's like 40 degree water. So you're like, you get a headache when you put your toe in. And uh, the first person I baptize runs out into the water and very poor community. Literally, this area that I'm in feels like you go back 200 years. It's like ox carts, horses, very few vehicles. There are some vehicles and some paved roads, but it's like going back in time. And so this lady's running out into the water, and she just has a potato sack tied around her. I mean, because there's, so, there's not, not a lot of wealth in this area of the world, a lot of poverty. Anyway... Baptizer, she comes out, and I found out later she was a witch her whole life. And then found out that God had totally delivered. She comes out, she's glowing like a light bulb. Like, literally the glory of God on her. The next day, I'm like, I'm journaling all of this, and it's just, it, it amazes me, like, what God's doing. Because it's like, I've never seen anything like this. I'm 19 years old, not like, this is insane. What's, what's happening? Uh, next day, it's late at night. The guys are like, hey, we need to go to this other town. And it's like 30 kilometers away. It's 10 at night. I'm like, they're like, they just start walking. I'm like, well, I guess, guess we're walking. <laughs> and so we get a, like a, probably an hour of walk in so far. And they're like, man, I'm tired. And then you just see them stop. And like, Lord, we need a truck. 60 seconds later, a truck comes over the hill they just get in the back no words exchanged i guess i'm getting in the back of this truck get in the back of the truck it takes us to the hotel we're staying at we get out we go into the hotel uh no we're booked up there's no rooms they come out these teenagers like lord we need two rooms and we need them paid for five minutes goes by the owner of the hotel comes out and says hey two people just checked out the rooms are paid for would you like them y yeah a week later, Mel's like, hey, I need you to go up to this town. It's about a two-hour train ride north of here, and I need you to find this guy that lives in this town. It's Usarisk. I said, okay. What's his address? I don't have an address. Well, what's his name? He gave his name. Um, do you have a phone number? No. Do you know somebody that knows him? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I go with this other guy, and he goes, I just feel like we're supposed to go to the market. I said, okay, let's go to the market. We get off the train, we go to the market, and he goes, oh, there he is. I'm like, it's a town of 100,000 people, right? It's like over and over and over. I, was, I kept seeing like this pattern, like, oh, you're real. <laughs> God, you're real, God. And there's, a, there's this new way like, that Paul talks about, the new way of the Spirit that we can walk in. So I, I came back from, you know, from that four months of being in, in Russia, just being like, wow. What, what, what just happened? I've got all these amazing things that I just witnessed. It's like walking around with modern-day apostles. That's what it felt like. But it's like, to them, they're like, this is just Christianity. This is just God life. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's not odd. This is just normal living. So I came back, and um, it's like, Mel had asked me to pastor a church. I'm 19. He asked me to pastor a church there. I'm 19. I am not moving to Russia. I am just not ready for that in my heart, my maturity level. I was just not ready. Um, and I'd been praying. I said, Lord, I would love to. Um, this is after I had moved back. I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm ready. I had, like I hadn't dated in a couple of years. So I was like, I feel like I'm ready to start dating again, but I don't want to date. date. I just want to meet. I just want to meet the right person. And then I got set up on a blind date with my now wife. Toby. And uh, that was January. You remember the snowstorm of 94? So the snow, like, so we dig out and somebody says, oh, by the way, hey, I've got this person I want you to meet. And I, I got to, as soon as like all the snow had melted, we get to go on a date, met her. And I said, hey, where are you going to go to school? She says, I'm going to go to Western Kentucky. I'm like, okay, great. Go home. Mom, I'm going to Western. <laughs> she goes, great. <laughs> so um, I'm really going to fly through some of this story. But, you know, we attended Western for four years. We get engaged after college. And um, as soon as my, as soon as I finished at Western, I remember sitting um, in my job, which was, I was doing an internship at Southeast Christian. And um, 
somebody had just told me about just being a persistent prayer warrior. Just pray about desires, things, needs that you, that you have. And one of the things I had written down that I just prayed about consistently is, God, when Toby and I get married, uh, because I'd helped an intern move in a year before into a house in Anchorage, and I said, what's the d deal here? They're like, oh, the family's moving to Italy. They just want us to look after their house, and then they're going to be gone for a year. I go, that's cool. So I had this idea in my head, like, Lord, I would love a, a free place to live with Toby for a year. Just free. I prayed it every day for about eight months. No one knew. She didn't know. I've been praying this. And I uh, had two weeks left in my internship. No job prospects. I'd interviewed with three or four different churches. No one even offered me a job opportunity. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on? We're getting married in two weeks. I don't have a job. Don't know how we're going to help, uh, afford health insurance. We don't have a place to live. We looked at about 10 different apartments, and she, she, she's just like, what's wrong with you? Why have you not signed a lease somewhere? I'm like, it, but she didn't know I had invested so much time into praying for a free place for a year, Lord. And so we're two weeks away from getting married. Her family thinks I'm nuts. I'm literally the, the nutty Christian guy that believes the Bible, like really believes it, or at least hopes it, a lot of it's true. But I've seen it. You know, you've seen the evidence with your own eyes. You're like, well, it worked for them. It's got to work for me, right? It's got to. And um, so anyway, it's like two days before my internship ends, and this guy says, hey, what are you going to do when you're done? I go, I have no idea. He goes, oh, you should just stay and work with us over in maintenance. So the Southeast has a maintenance department, big facility. He said, why don't you go talk to so-and-so? So I go talk to this, this guy, and he says, oh, man. He goes, oh, yeah, you'd be a great fit. And he opens up his j j drawer and slides a garage door opener towards me. He goes, do you need a place to live? I go, yeah. He goes, well, we have an, a house on the edge, of proper, the edge of the property that's not been lived in for a year, and we just need somebody to be in it, be present, look after it, take care of it. He goes, we can't charge you rent. I said, obviously. <laughs> yeah, of course. And um, um, he goes, but only, he said, make, make sure it's right. It's the right fit. I'm like, well, I go, uh, I'm just going to say yes now. Uh, he goes, no, you really should show it to Toby first. I said, uh, we'll take it. <laughs> I just knew because I, I knew that I knew. Um, went and picked up Toby, told her the whole story about just praying for eight months for a place to live for free. And it was literally a year to the day, a year later, that that my boss at that time walks up to me and says, hey, we acquired some other properties and people are living in, the, in them. We're charging them rent. And to be fair, we need to charge you rent. I said, yeah, that's fine. But, and then that moment, I got to tell him the story. Got to tell him the, the story of the free house. Now, fast forward... Uh, to after that, uh, probably about two years, and so I, I had worked at Southeast for about two or three years, but I'd always had a desire to just start something new, start something from scratch. And I hadn't really talked to Toby about it. I was like, man, I would love to plant a church sometime. That'd just be fun. I'd enjoy that. And uh, get a call randomly from a guy down in Florida. I get a job offer for a church plant in Orlando, brand new church plant. And I go home and tell Toby about it. She goes, yep, we're moving to Florida. I go, how do you know? She goes, he's been showing me Florida license plates for a year. I go, are you sure? Is that how God talks to you, like through license plates? I'm like, but it's real, right? It's like you just trust the things that God shows you. You're like, if you choose to believe, like, I think God's giving me some breadcrumbs here. I am think he's giving me some God winks. And he's like, he, he wants to lead us. He's good. And so we spent about uh, a year down there and... Um, Everything about the experience was amazing except for one thing. And that was my relationship with the pastor <laughs> of that church. We were like oil and water. I was a kind of, a, I was a spirit guy, you know, and this is, this guy was a, put his hands on things and control and uh, we have to manage this stuff and a lot of fear. And so we did not get along well. I ended up getting fired after being there for 12 months. And I remember coming home just feeling really, you know, broken, disconnected, like feeling like a failure and like, Lord, what is going on? Like, uh, you know, a, a long season of anti-establishment, like 
the church sucks and who who wants it's so broken and like yeah i mean it's 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 made up of a bunch of perfect people that act imperfectly <laughs> i'll say that i don't know maybe we'll correct that later <laughs> um but um in that season toby and i both got a job at at starbucks the one that's at hurstborn and shelbyville road and i was like i don't know what we're going to do but at part time hours they offer health insurance this is great well, one, one night I'm working there, and there's this guy doing live music. His name's Dan Wiglob. Great dude. And uh, sounds just like James Taylor, like just amazing. And he goes, hey, Joel, I heard you play music. You want to get up here and play something? I'm like, oh, sure, I'll, I'll do something. And then he's like, buddy, why are you making coffee drinks for people when you should be doing this? I go, oh, there's no way to make money in that. He goes, yes, there is. He goes, I, I'll set you up all over town with everybody that I know. He ends up calling me like a couple days later and saying, hey, I got you uh, 10 gigs. 10? I'm like, oh, my gosh. So anyway, I, I quit Starbucks because I was getting so many opportunities and making more money and working like 10% of the time. 10% of the time I spent at Starbucks, you know, I was, it was just so great. And um, in that season, it was wild. I ended up getting a record deal. Um, and we put out, we, we recorded an EP, which is, uh, you know, like a, it's not a full length record. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a like a five song, six song, um, uh, album. And we started getting all these amazing opportunities. It's like, what is going on? This is really interesting because as an artist, you're more critical of yourself than you are of anybody else, you know, as, as an artist, typically, and I just remember like, my music's not that great, but there's undeniable favor on my life. And God just started opening doors. Next thing you know, we're, we're opening for major bands, like household names, like REO Speedwagon and Collective Soul. Like, what is going on? This is wild, Lord. Like, what are you doing? And clear as day, I had one of my buddies that's a spiritual mentor of mine that was traveling with us on one of these trips, and he said, I think God's telling me that you're supposed to walk away. I go, oh my gosh, he's telling me the same thing. You're exactly right. It was like, and our our single, which is the song that you're hoping will get you acclaim and success and kind of create some momentum for you, um, was to go to radio in a day, like the next day, which means there's a thousand at the time, you know, there were CDs, everything wasn't just online, that were going out to a thousand radio stations. And God said, walk away. And I had to call these people. I'm like, hey, God, I feel like I'm supposed to step away from this right now. And they're like, I burned a lot of bridges in that moment. It was really, really hard. So, um, but also in a place where I was letting a dream die. I was letting a ambition, a part of like how my identity had been, you know, intertwined with that thought. I'm letting it die. And for a long season, I was like, what am I going to do? So ended up doing some remodeling gigs and some all these other um anything i could do to try to make money and is around 2011 so it's it like it's about four or five years six years of me doing remodeling i just remember the lord um telling me one day very clearly i'd come into a new season where some people had introduced me to adoration prayer and adoration prayer is simply taking god's names nature character as revealed in scripture praying it to him out loud with an expectation that he's going to reveal himself to you in a very real way where you, you move from a, a informational knowing into an intimate knowing. And as a result of intimacy increasing, there's a sensitivity to his voice, like an extreme sensitivity where you're like, yep, I know it's you speaking to me right now. And he told me to put down my tool belt, close my business. I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I'm like, if I go, okay, if I go home and I tell Toby, God's telling me to quit my job, and she responds favorably, I'll know you're in this. <laughs> that was that was kind of me bartering with him. And so anyway, I go home, I tell her, she was like, yep, I wanted you, you could have quit yesterday. I'm like, what on earth? Just a really amazing season. And... uh so I quit my job, not sure exactly what I'm going to do. This is 2011, 
Um, we're entering 2012. So for a whole year, we just kind of lived like, I have no idea how we're going to pay the bills, how we're going to do whatever. Fast forward, um, the, the ministry that I had connected with, which was Iron Bell, uh, also launched a music arm, which was turned into Iron Bell Music. If you're fami not familiar with it, I'll share some of, some of that music with you later if you're interested in it. It is powerful stuff. It's incredible. Um, and it's all based out of adoration, which is just singing directly to God. His name's nature and character. Second Corinthians 3. We all with unveiled faces beholding his glory as in a mirror are being transformed into the exact same image as in a mirror. In this process of adoration, what you're realizing is the God that you see is transforming you into the God you see. But it requires, I mean, transformation technology in the spirit is simply seeing him. It's intimate knowing, right? So I'm going through the season of like, oh, wow, this is incredible. Like people can really know you intimately. It's not a pipe dream to think that people can know you intimately. It's not far off. You're not the distant God. You're, you're the near God. You're the God that sees me. You're the God that heals me. You're the, God, you're the Psalm 103 God that heals all my diseases. You're all these, don't forget his benefits. This is who you are. You're a father. You're good. You're merciful. You're faithful. You're just and righteous. And, um, and out of that process, um, I began seeing people healed. We're doing all these, we're traveling. We're seeing all this ministry take place and like radical miracles. Like, like I experienced in Russia. I'm like, oh, this is it. This is it. The miracles are happening, right? And, but that, lead, that led to a, probably a season two where I was, getting, I was getting exhausted, like you were talking about, Ashley, and you're like, Bible studies, you're seeing these women exhausted, and you're like, why am I exhausted? We're seeing miracles, like miracles are happening. Bodies are being healed, people are being delivered, all this stuff's happening. And, um, I mean, it was spring of last year, and uh, I'd called up Matt Thompson and just said, "Hey, let's let's go out, let's get together." And we got together for some pizza. And I remember um, sitting down with him. And in the past, Matt and I have connected in the past. And I knew I remember Matt had been kind of resistant to the things of the spirit in the past. And so I was a little surprised when we were sitting down to pizza, and I felt like the Lord said, "Tell Matt everything he, I'm teaching you." I'm like, everything. Because everything is like, like, like the me a year ago would think the me now is really, really, really weird. Like, wouldn't even. Hang. So I don't know what even Matt's gonna do. So anyway, I started sharing all this stuff about sonship, about identity, and he starts saying st something to the effect of, "Wow, you sound a lot like Sylvia." And I'm like, "Who's Sylvia?" And he goes, "Oh man!" And he starts telling me about the study. He's like, "You got to come to this study," and. Um, I did skip a part real quick. You know, it was like, this was probably five years ago. I had been working in marketing, and God said, I want you to lay this down. It's time to step into your own ministry. Step into my own ministry. And, uh, but it's a la George Mueller, Mueller style. And George Mueller, if you're not familiar with him, lived in 1810 to like 1890, 1900-ish. He lived in Bristol, England. He was German descent, but he lived in Bristol, England, and the Lord told him to start an orphanage. And... Uh, the one caveat was, George, you're not allowed to tell anybody anything you need. You have to just pray, and I'll provide what you need. Well, I had a buddy, uh, I was at my nephew's birthday party, um, and this guy comes up to me and says, hey, have you ever heard of George Mueller? I'm like, no. I'm like, who's George Mueller? And he starts telling me this whole history. He goes, I'm going to get you a book sometime. And uh, I'm like, okay, all right. I go, so what are you doing? He goes, well, I quit my job, and I'm just doing street ministry like George Mueller. I'm like, or, you know, George Mueller didn't do a whole lot of street ministry, but he's, he was living his life like George Mueller, which was just wait on the Lord, I'll provide. You're not going to earn a wage. I'm like, okay, buddy. <laughs> hope, hope that works out for you. You know, that's what I'm thinking. And uh, the next day, one of my buddies calls me, and he goes, hey, I'm at the airport. Are you home? I go, yeah. He goes, I have to come by right now. I said, okay. So he gets over to our house, and it's like 9 o'clock at night, and he goes, I was on the flight, 
and God told me I had to give you this book. I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And he goes, it's all about this guy named, I go, George Mueller? He goes, yeah, George Mueller. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, of course, okay, I'm paying attention now, Lord. And like 20 more like confirmations in a month. I had strangers walking up to me for two months. Hey, have you ever heard of George Mueller? I feel like I'm supposed to talk to you about George Mueller. I'm like, it's getting weird, God. This is weird. And then I found this cassette tape of my grandfather preaching that we didn't even know existed. And it's from 1977. And I'm listening to this cassette tape. And he said, when we were on the mission field, I'd have all these businessmen come up to me and say, Pastor Brune, we know you have needs at the church. What do you need? And he said, I'd tell them the same thing I told everybody because I based my whole ministry on. You never tell a man in public what you pray in private. And I'm like, pull over and just weeping. And I'm like, okay, I get it. You want to be my father. You really want to provide. You want to do these things. So um, five years ago, Toby and I were like, okay, I think it's time for me to quit this job and start this ministry. I don't even know what the ministry is going to be. I don't even know what it is. I'm just supposed to go. Abraham, go to the land. I will show you. That's what it felt like. And um, don't tell anybody anything you need. Just wait. I'm like, <laughs> oof. Is oh, man, five years in. And he's good. He is faithful. He is true. So back to Matt. It's like, you sound just like Sylvia. I'm like, who's this Sylvia lady? <laughs> and so I started uh, attending last um, winter, spring. So it's probably right around March, April last year when I started uh, coming to the study. And I'm like, wait, what does Galatians 2.20 mean? Wait, Romans 6, 7, 8. Wait. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, what? First Corinthians, second Corinthians. She's going through all these truths about it's by faith, it's an indwelling presence. I'm like, wait a minute. So the whole gospel for the whole man for the whole world, right? The whole say it out loud. The whole gospel for the whole man to the whole world. Right, it's the whole the whole gospel. I'm like, I'd only heard part of the gospel. And I felt pretty good because I had definitely where Sylvia talks about the blood of Jesus, which is atonement. She talks about the body of, of Christ, which is for our deliverance, right? The, she talks about the resurrection, which is our new creation ness. She talks about the ascension, which is we're raised and seated with him. There's no more separation. You're, you're with him. You're with him. Well, I really got one, three, and four, but I really didn't get two. I didn't get the deliverance. I didn't really get, I didn't fully understand this union life that everybody's been talking about. All these teachers have been talking about. It didn't make sense to me. And then so I, I start hearing it over and over and over and over and over. And Matt even pointed out when Ashley spoke, she's like, he's like, oh my gosh, she's been listening to this for five months and she already has all of this understanding. <laughs> It's incredible, right? I was like, some of us, it just takes a little longer. We're listening, we're listening, we're listening, we're listening, and we're just waiting because faith comes by hearing and just it's, and just let it come in and let it produce what it's going to produce in you. And uh, But the revelation of this stuff comes both through, we talked about it earlier, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So it comes through the word, capital W, like Christ. It comes through him. And it also comes through our testimony. So we, when, these, these, when the reality of this gospel is in story form and we hear each other's stories, that's when the rubber meets the road. And you're like, oh, I get it. So when, like last year, Rich Stanley, um, he's in Colorado, part of this group, one of Norman's, a Normanite. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever been said before. I just made it up. <laughs> um, shared a story about him leading a heroin addict to the Lord in a bar, right? And the heroin addict sees him later and is like, I'm still using heroin. Do you have any advice? And he just kept pointing him to Christ. It's Christ. Just keep declaring that Jesus is your deliverance, is what he told him. The body death of Jesus, his body. So, you know, sins being the fruit hanging out on the end of the tree, but sin being the trunk and the roots, the sin spirit, the spirit of Satan, the spirit of error, is dealt with in his body. Christ's body 
became sin for us, right? And just understanding that, well, you know, a week later, he sees that guy again. Rich sees this guy, and he goes, how are you doing? He goes, I'm delivered. I'm clean, right? Because now you're, Rich didn't give him a law. Because if you give him a law, you're empowering sin. Why? Because the law is the power of sin. It's the strength of sin. So you hear the story, and you're like, oh. I love how, like, Tim Keller just passed away, like, a week or so ago. I love Tim. And Tim had this saying where he said, you know, um, a lot of um, religions, he goes, this is going to sound like an overstatement, or a, um, but he said, generally, most religions are uh, instructions speckled with stories. But the gospel and our faith is a story speckled with instructions. But by and large, it's a story. And how are we saved? We mix belief with the story. We hear the story and we just mix it with belief. It's what it is. So now I'm going to hit a little bit on Like some, like one of the things that Brett brought up that made me think of anyway. It said many, de- you know, many denominations have gospels, but they're not not informed and filtered through the parameters of the new covenant. If you don't have a new covenant gospel, it's just going to be fractured or an added to gospel it's still going to hold on to separation. It's still going to hold on to depravity and old, the old heart of stone. It doesn't want to understand or accept that God wants to cause you to walk in his ways. That's the new covenant. He will cause you to walk in his ways by being the doer in you. He becomes the doer. In the new covenant, God says, my presence is out of the box, and now it's in you. And he becomes the doer. Louis brought this up. What does it mean to imitate Jesus? I put up a post out a couple weeks ago, and it got... <laughs> I stepped on some toes. Because <laughs> it was like, uh, one of my friends said, Woo, you are like really prodding the religious spirits, getting a rise out of them on this one. Because I basically said, stop trying to be like Jesus. And then I explained what that meant. Some people only listen to the first two seconds and they just put in their comments. Like, you got to listen to the whole thing. Stop trying to be like Jesus because it's not your effort. If he's the doer in you, it has to be by him that it is Christ in you. So what is the definition of imitation? Because I heard this a lot. What does it mean to imitate Jesus or imitate Paul imitating Jesus? Because Paul says, imitate me imitating Jesus. It's not you trying to be like Jesus because of his example. It's this Philippians 2 reality that says, let this mind, this is what Louis was talking about, that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, emptied self, completely emptied, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man, you came in the likeness of men and you're found in the appearance of man, but you have God in you. That's the difference. The imitation is it cannot be flesh. It has to be him in you. The imitation is Christ didn't do it by flesh because if he did it by flesh, then that would be the example you have to follow. And none of us want that because you're doomed to failure. If we believe God only forgave our sins because of Christ's work on the cross, we believe the cross isn't powerful enough to produce a Romans 8 reality in our present lives. And then lastly, I would say this. Many of us have been taught like sanctification means we're being made better. We can perform better. But my friend Chris Blackaby says Jesus didn't come to improve you. He came to replace you. You're not meant to be improved. He's replacing you. It doesn't get simpler than that. 
you have to die. I'm literally sharing this, all of this stuff with a friend of mine. He, um, this past week, we were on the phone for an hour and a half. He's like, and he's, because he talks about going back and trying to, um, like some, you know, inner child work, you know, you're going back, but psychological terms or psychology terms where you're trying to go back and do some healing. And it's real stuff, but it's like, um, the, the fast, Sometimes, let me say this, sometimes fast solution is just die. What did Louis say? He says, if you don't have Christ in you, wanting to die is actually the best thing you could desire. But it's the old you. It's not your physical body dying. It's literally the, 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 the person. And then you exchange persons. He replaces you. He comes in and it's, it's, it's him and you. Isn't that good news?